more uh, keynote speeches, one after the other. The first one is by uh, Susan Harris Hummer, who comes from uh, Speyer University, German University of Administrative Sciences. Uh, she has done her doctorate at Oxford University on uh, uh, looking at evaluation uh, quality assurance practices uh, in Germany. Her area of research is also a research fellow uh, and, and, and uh, uh, assistant professor, associate professor. And her area is looking at the uh, evaluators. Uh, I, I would call it as a special uh, academic tribe. Uh, she has published her PhD with the title Evaluating the Evaluators. And I was actually asking her whether her PhD was in what specific uh, discipline, what specific science, because it sounded to me like sociology or, or even anthropology. Uh, it was in education, if I understood correctly. So today she's going to talk about uh, quality assurance, where do we go now from here, and she's going to, uh, to talk about an international comparative uh, study that includes Germany, Great Britain, and China. And as I said at the beginning, we welcome Susan because also because it's her first time at Corpinos and Budapest and at the conference. And thank you very much for accepting the invitation. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to Budapest. And I would like to also say thank you to everybody for being here. Um, when I was asked to, uh, to do a keynote, um, I thought, right, what, what should I talk about? And I thought, well, I'd like to tell you a little bit about comparative systems. And I've been working in the area of quality assurance and management for a good many years, um, in particular in Germany. But my research looks at different systems of QA. And so that's what I'm bringing in with me. Can you hear me back at the end? Otherwise, I'll speak a bit more loudly. Can you hear me? So perhaps a bit provocatively, where do we go from here? That I will actually answer possibly at the end of the talk rather than at the very beginning. So where are we coming from? I think that's where we need to start. So first of all, a blank piece of paper, but not quite so blank. Higher education started, at least in Europe, uh, thinking about Bologna, Paris, and so forth. Very small communities, one person speaking about a particular form of area, and people in a small room listening to <coughs> the teacher in question. It's a very different scenario today. We have laboratories, high-tech, places of learning and researching, and I'm sure that this scenario here will be familiar to many of you. We have very cool lecture theatres, students with laptops, iPads, iPhones, where we can have state-of-the-art responses just in time to how lecturers are presenting and so forth. It's a very different kettle of fish. And of course that poses questions of quality in as much as how can I actually transfer my knowledge to this number of people and how can they actually then acquire the competences in their fields that I may have, but they might not at this point in time. And we're, we're certainly talking today about the uh, acquirement of competences, so irrespective of subject discipline, we had uh, the idea of, we were talking earlier about soft skills, and I think that is a, a very important area of higher education, that you become an, uh, a, an expert in the field of management, irrespective of your area, you need to have skills of mediation and time management and so forth. Those are the things that we expect our graduates should be able to take on board during a degree program. So if we think about the most recent changes in higher education, we have some, some large and important decision making that were taken and we're looking back 20 years already at Sorbonne, Bologna, and Prague in particular at those this time, when we realized in Europe that we had areas of, of higher education that didn't really stand in conformity with one another, and decisions of quite great importance were taken to try and bring or align different areas together. So in other words, 
words, one of the main aspects was to bring in the two-tier degree system. And I'm based in Germany, and it was a very major form of argument within German higher education whether we wanted to go down that route or not. So effectively we had lots of professors uh, deciding more or less with gritted teeth to bring in bachelor and master programs whereas in the past they had magister and master programs so, and diploma. So again quite major challenges there. We had the introduction of the system of credits and a definition of what that meant. And one of the issues was we wanted to make the whole European arena of higher education more mobile. Well, I would argue in actual fact Germany has become far less mobile. When I studied in Germany in the 80s, um, there were blackboards around the university saying, offering second semester chemistry, Marburg would like to go to Munich for the third semester, for example. And you could swap during your degree program according to somebody who would then swap with you. Well, that has been lost. In other words, you cannot do that as easily because the degree programs have become far more regimented. But the whole idea of Sabon and Bologna and Prague was to promote the European cooperation idea. And specifically in quality assurance terms. So in other words, we would be looking at degree programs irrespective of whether I was offering, for example, a Bachelor in Economics in Budapest or in Sheffield or in Bonn, it was assumed that I would be getting the same standard of education and this approximately the same amount of information at bachelor's level. So I'd like to think a little bit again about what higher education actually is. Well, we have communities of knowledge. And as I mentioned, we are thinking in terms of gaining subject-specific expertise. So in other words, I decide to study chemistry, or I decide to study politics, or a foreign language. But I'm also thinking about personal development. So in other words, I'm not the same person at the end of my degree than I was when I started. I have learned a lot about myself in the process. And I have gained competences, for example, in those areas that I was talking about just now. Universities remain places of expertise. So if we remember the very first slide with that very small group of people, one person who has the expertise, transferring this knowledge to someone else. But we are increasingly finding higher education as a place of vocational training too. And that's, to some extent in Germany, also something that is, is, is causing a certain amount of tension because German universities saw themselves as the areas of theory training, and yet now they are becoming far more, it is being expected that they should be training far more in terms of the soft skills and vocational training as well, which were predominantly done in Fakultschulen, which are, were regarded as a, a less theoretical form of higher education. Universities still remain, higher education still remain, places where we create, we test, we trial, we find things that don't work as much as we find things that do work, and that's important to allow experimentation to happen. But that also means we need to look at what we're doing, so we're examining the processes behind our research and our teaching. And as Watson says, higher education definitely remains places where we contribute to society as a whole, and to nation building. I was walking around Budapest this morning, and I went past the academic club, the academy club, where we're going to be tonight, and I read on a tablet that this was a place where much of the Hungarian nation building actually was debated. So a place where people came together to discuss how the actual nation could be developed in the future. So what else is higher education? I'm sure that not all of this will be new. This will be very familiar to all of you in this room. They are places where we remember things as well as create new things. If we think about university libraries, and all of this is becoming digitalized now. 
I'm thinking about the, you know, the Bodleian Library in Oxford, where everything that's published in the English language has an automatic right to be archived and left within the Bodleian Library, and yet all of that is now becoming digitalized, so we can see it from that side too. So depositories for our future generations, we don't forget the past. Higher education obviously is supposed to equip graduates for employment. And if we think about the revolutions of the past, and I'm thinking here about the 1968 revolution and student revolution in Germany, where a lot of debate on the campus took place about how Germany as a place in higher education could be developed. It didn't happen outside the institution, but that was where it happened, in Munich, for example. They, debates going on within the student body about what they wanted higher education to be. Thinking in terms of the, the theories behind higher education then. In the 70s we had the notion that, well, higher education was a sort of organized anarchy. If we're thinking about the individual professor back then, in his ivory tower, the ivory tower is portrayed rather provocatively in the middle here. So a professor could decide on his own what he or she wanted to do. And there was practically nobody above the professor who could say what he or she should do. And we had a number of professors working alongside each other, each in their so-called own individual ivory tower. And they didn't even have to necessarily make goals or organize aims for where they wished to stand. It was their own decision-making process. Slightly later, I came up with the notion of loosely coupled systems. So in other words, we're moving into a slightly different area now, where <coughs> universities are beginning to relate, you know, in other words, the professoriate, they are beginning to talk more with each other about what they're doing and cooperating more, so more loosely coupled, but still not in a proper system as such. Mintzberg also describes universities as professional bureaucracies where we have little middle management. Well, I think if we look at how universities of today are managed, obviously the 1983 notion that he presents has changed remarkably since that time. I think middle management today has a far more important function in how universities as a whole are working. Ron Barnett of Great Britain, one of the most eminent uh, researchers of higher education in Britain, has called higher education today super complex. And I keep coming back to that term because I think, as you, know, as, as you will recognize in your role as Vice President, what you're, what you're going to be facing in terms of the strategic development of this institution is probably super complex. It's about the soft, it's about the, not, not just about the actual goal of where you wish your institution to go, but you have to think about the people who are actually going to be doing it. So you cannot just make the equation without the players. So one has to have a very good knowledge of the entire institution to understand the mechanisms of people management that are going on in each faculty and in, in each area. Others have described universities today as entrepreneurial, where things are becoming far more linked to industry, and we can't exclude industry from higher education. That's a bit of a contentious issue, I think, but some have described higher education in those terms. So you're probably thinking, what, where, where am I going right now? What does this mean? Well, what is quality then in higher education? Now, this is my translation of a quote that I found. <coughs> I, I really think it, it, it gets it. So quality in higher education is a bit like love. Not tangible, yet present. You can experience it, definitely. Yet not quantify it. It remains fleeting. So you have to consistently and repeatedly engage with it. And I like that, because I think that as, a, as someone who's worked in quality management for a number of years, I think that really sums it up very much. You have to keep working at it. You cannot just let it be. Quality assurance involves engagement all the time. So if we think about the DEAN norms um, and the ISO norms here, um, they defined the degree in which 
it's a sort of set of inherent properties. And they said, well, it can be poor, weak, or excellent even, in contrast with being applied to. But it's a constant characteristic here. I think that's, that's quite an important point. So in other words, we're, we're thinking about something that is there and constantly there, and yet we have to monitor and look at it, how it always develops. So quality management as such, that looks at a very large number of areas. So we have, for example, politics, goals, strategy, projects, evaluation, all the mechanisms behind quality assurance, surveys, interviews, focus groups, all of that are involved at this point. And that's the definition that the Dine, that Dine 9000 comes up with. So that makes it easy, right? So we've got something a bit like a rabbit. That's why I put the rabbit here with a target set right in the middle of the rabbit. The rabbit can run very fast and sometimes it goes off at a right angle when you least expect it to. It's something that we can't really determine yet. You know it's there, quality is there. It's a moving target with fluctuating leaders, new people coming in, changing leadership. That won't stay the same for, the, for a generation, say. We might have changing rectors every three years in an institution. What does that mean in terms of quality assurance? And we also have to deal with changing legislation, whether that be at European, lead, at European level or at local level. So in terms of the European higher education arena, a regulation was brought in to try and make some sense of this whole area that we call higher education and what quality assurance within that means. So it was established 2000, and again it's around at the same time as Bologna and Sorbonne going on, for example, because they realised they had to do something to try and bring all of these different threads together. So this ENQA was introduced to try and discuss and to try and make a platform for European discussion on quality assurance. So it's also a think tank place where we can actually come together and talk about where we think systems are going. And of course it does, you know, obviously the members of universities are represented in Inquire. So what are the areas of higher education that we're looking at when we're talking about quality assurance? Well, definitely we're looking at learning. One of the key areas, obviously, is how well are we transferring our expertise into the heads of the people who are sitting in those lecture theatres or in working in the laboratories because they're the ones that we are trying to bring our knowledge to. We're also looking at how well the leadership of an institution is actually dealing with the management of, for example, a faculty or a research project. We're definitely also looking at how well a research management project is being undertaken, looking at competences, levels of competence, how good we communicate within the institution, how well the strategy of the institution is working, but firstly, before we get to the strategy, how do we have a strategy? Who is involved? And how well is that communicated? Internationalization, of course, the administration of the university. We must not forget the people who are doing all the support work. And metrics and rankings are also involved. Short word about rankings before I carry on. Rankings, are important these days. I think every university leader will definitely want to at least look at a ranking, and many look at a whole range of them. And yet, I have a problem with rankings because I know for a fact that they don't always represent what an institution is capable of. So I think there's an expression to take rankings with a pinch of salt. I think everybody needs to think about the value of the rankings in terms of their institution. Does it really represent the quality of what is going on? So let's look briefly at models of QM. Enqua has put up this model, which was created in 2012. Those are the EFQM, rather. So we have the enablers of QM, 
the leadership, the people, the strategy, partnerships and resources, and they then provide the results on the other hand. So the people results, for example, customer results. When I say customers, I'm usually talking here in this scenario about students. They are the student customers. Society results, in other words, what is the institution, for example, here, higher education achieving in general? And also, in terms of the transfer between the institution and the wider society, businesses working in allegiance with higher education institutions. And EFQM came up with a, a topic known as radar logic. It's easy to remember. So radar stands for results. The R is results. A for approaches to something. D deploy. A assess and refine. So in other words, the first part, the first, the first one is well, where do we want to go? So in other words, first we're thinking about which direction we're taking. Next one, well, how do we get there? Which are the methods that we are going to incorporate to get from A to B? Deploy, well, that's the actual action of implementing a particular project or, for example, a survey, for example. Assess, we want to know how well we're doing. And then refine, the last stage, is the fine-tuning. We've, we've analysed what we're doing and then we're thinking about how we can make it better next time. Having said that, I think there's a lot of prototyping that goes on in higher education in terms of evaluations. One of my other areas is that I work uh, within the German Evaluation Society in higher education. And that seems to still need a lot of discussion about the quality of evaluation methods still today. Another model of QM, I'm sure you're familiar with this one, PECA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. And if you look at that, you might think, well, hang on a minute, radar logic, that sounds familiar. And frankly, they are very similar. It's just a different terminology. This was developed by somebody called Shivat, and it became later known as the deeming cycle. He changed the word from, uh, from study, which was originally study, into check. That was controversial because, of course, in higher education, a professor doesn't want to have his work checked. Study, maybe, but check, hmm, not quite so keen. So the word check, if, you're, if you start a quality assurance system, wasn't always received very well by the professoriate. But it's become the, the, the common term to say check, so that's the word that is now being used. Another model is the Total Quality Management Model, TQM. This is a far more comprehensive model. Australia, for example, introduced the system, but in the meantime, they've, already, they've, they've decided that this is just going a bit too fast, and they've taken a step back again from TQM. TQM, for a while, was the model that everyone in QA was striving to, to take on board. So it's interesting when, when countries have tried it out and then realise it's perhaps too, there's too much to it. So in other words, it's, it's too much because we don't have the capacity to really do this system. So I'd now like to look at three examples. I said I was going to bring a couple of European examples and maybe further afield. So what's Germany been doing in terms of quality assurance? This will be familiar to all of you. Program accreditation is the same in Germany as it is for many other countries in Europe. In other words, if I have a degree program, it has to be accredited. And that is a standard, so-called standard of quality. So what does it do? It really only examines that minimal standards are being maintained. Minimal standards. We're not talking about good or excellent. One of the plus sides, perhaps in terms of the people who have to go through the evaluation or the, the accreditation process, is usually it's in, within a six to eight year time frame. Which means that when you've done it, you can then say, okay, we've had all of that activity and we can relax again. And I know that is, that is a normal human reaction to having gone through program accreditations. So they don't really want to carry on engaging, and I mentioned the engagement aspect about QA right at the beginning. One of the downsides in Germany, each accreditation costs in the region of 15,000 
between eight and 15,000, depending on whether it's an individual or a clustered uh, accreditation process. So Germany thought, well, this is a good system, maybe, but we want to try out something else. So a few years ago, they introduced an entirely different system of examining the quality of higher education. And it's the system accreditation that I'm talking about here. This is a quite different kettle of fish to a program accreditation. Here we are looking at how well the entire institution is working in terms of its quality assurance. Everybody, not just one faculty with one degree program, but the whole institution. One of the plus sides is that when you are thinking about the system accreditation, you can choose your own means, your own system. I haven't got the current figures for you, but I think Germany at the moment has about 70, don't hold me to that, but it's about 70 universities and uh, higher education institutions that have gone through system accreditation. And if you look at the systems, you'll see very different systems as to how they built up their quality approach within their institutions. They choose themselves their systems of checks and balances. System accreditation also means that effectively you are accrediting yourself. It doesn't mean that you're completely free of an, of an external accreditation agency. An agency will still come in and look at the system and see how well the system is working and then come again but you are the ones to do the accreditation once you've been given the seal of approval. The cost of system accreditation per institution are at something in the region of 60,000 euros. So if you are a large university, I'm sure you can do the maths. It makes perfect sense to go with this method rather than an individual program accreditation for, I don't know, maybe a hundred different uh, program accreditations. The downside is it takes a long time getting there. Because, of course, you have to take the whole institution with you and get them all on board so that when the agency comes in and the experts engage with your system, that irrespective of whether you're in the physics department, the economics department, the foreign languages department, that everybody says the same thing. They understand the system, they're working with the system, and so forth. And that's a quite tall order. And I'm speaking there from personal experience because I was responsible for the example that I'm going to show you in a minute which is the University of Würzburg. I, I was working at this university, effectively preparing the university for system accreditation when I left in 2015. So I, my, my last step was the document to be handed over to the accreditation agency requesting that they, be, that they start the system accreditation procedure. So here we have a system of QA at one institution. It's an eight year cycle. Unfortunately, I couldn't translate this for you, so I'll, I'll tell you what. Have we got a point in here? Yes. So effectively, we have a, a new degree program, and then it goes through an eight-year cycle. Quite a long time before we get to an evaluation of the entire subject area. So it might be chemistry, and within chemistry, there will be different kinds of degree programs, and all of them will be examined at the same time. Then we have an audit and an internal certification of that degree program. It seems like a long time. But if you've really been paying attention after the coffee break, you're probably asking yourselves, what's this thing here? Right? What's, what's this thing going on here? What's that thing? I'll show you what the thing is. Annual monitoring. So we have a system of eight years in which you have to go through the process. But every year, at certain times of the year, we're going through these stages. So I'll just tell you, we have, first of all, in October, um, we have the graduate survey. Then we have teaching evaluations conducted at this time in the winter semester. Data set produced and produced and made ready in January. Then we have a commission that sits and talks about these things. Then we have a report. This is the report that follows on from this. This is produced in March. Then we have the next summer semester following <coughs> with another uh, report here about the quality of teaching, more evaluations, 
And this, this is the annual discussion with the university leaders here. And effectively, once a year, they will be talking about all of these things and making plans and making changes, maybe making new goals. The University of Frankfurt has a slightly different system, but similar. Here we have, again, teaching evaluation, which is symbolized with the orange. Can you see the orange here? And then a student, this is the um, degree, uh, graduate survey, uh, the degree program evaluation here. This doesn't happen that frequently. We have a main one in year three. These are the data sets which are produced year one, two, four, five, and seven. And the internal reaccreditation of this system happens in year six when you've gone through this procedure. So again, you can see the use of data, the use of metrics, and various methods of <coughs> feedback. So I'm going to make a quick switch. I've got precisely six minutes to get through two countries, so I'm now going to have to whiz it. Great Britain, Royal Charter, so they don't actually accredit their degree program. So with the Royal Charter, you are entitled to award degrees. That's a difference in the legislation in Great Britain. The Quality Assurance Agency is an external body that does the gauging with bringing in experts to look at the quality of an institution. And one thing that the QAA has done is create a so-called quality code. And I would really, if you don't know the quality code yet, do have a look at it. It's really good. It's a very detailed brief about a number of areas of higher education. So it could be examining, assessing, Feedback quality, all of these things are in here. And for example, doctoral supervision, master supervising, it's all defined by the quality code. And one thing in Great Britain, they did subject benchmark statements. In other words, irrespective of whether I'm studying chemistry in Sheffield or in Birmingham or in London, effectively, the universities are on a par with each other in terms of what their contents of the degree programs are. Germany is a long way away from this amount of quality. I would like to see German professors agree on subject benchmarks. I don't see it happening. But it, they managed to do it in Great Britain. Types of review, the main one I will focus on is the quality and standards review. And the departments in England are, and in Great Britain are obviously very concerned about the quality of their programs. So when the QA comes with external members to look at the quality, that is, a, a, again, quite an important moment in time, and they don't want to do badly in these reviews. Research has also come under the spotlight. So in other words, I think my peers in, a, in Great Britain are probably the most examined and controlled academics probably worldwide, and I do not envy them for it either. So they need to be accountable, not only in their teaching, but in their research, and all of this needs documented. Every single doctoral supervisor has to record his supervisions. Again, if I said that to, sir, to professors in Germany, they would laugh in my face and say, I'm not going to do that. I choose when I write something about my doctoral students. But in Britain, you have to record everything. And they look at it as well when they come in. So it's a very tight form of quality review in research. But not only that, they've now very recently done the same thing for teaching excellence quite controversial. They only introduced it in 2017 as a pilot, but a large number of British universities actually went in and did that. And the standards that can be awarded gold, silver, and bronze, it was quite a shock to some of the big named universities when they maybe didn't get the gold standard that they thought automatically that they should get. Turning to China now, I've got three more minutes. China has gone, again, from a very different system of the important Mandarin as being like, you know, thinking again about the origins of higher education with a single professor, a single expert. We've gone through a system of pretty, well, totalitarianism to an opening of China now. So it is changing hugely in terms of its higher education system. The notion here is we wish to decentralize. So China, I think, represents a mix of centralized decision making, but still quite a lot of autonomy at the university level. So I think there's quite, a, quite an interesting balance going on here. 
But they're also very keen, and they were very keen to, um, to get in the rankings internationally. And so they thought, well, looking across at places like Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, and Princeton, and so forth, they wanted to have equally high, reputable institutions that were up there. So they chose a group, and they are effectively being promoted to become these lighthouses of Chinese higher education. So this is a, a map, if you like, that a colleague of mine drew a few years ago, but I think it's still relevant today. So we have external quality assurance systems, and we have agencies, but one thing that I think is interesting is a lot is happening within the institution. And there is a strong emphasis on the quality of teaching in China. You cannot get away with being a poor teacher. And also in terms of um, the support that young academics, when they're starting their academic teaching careers, they will have an, a far more eminent or more experienced professor coming into their teaching to support them in the early phase of their work. I think that's, that's great, to have somebody who's, in other words, supporting them from the beginning. So teaching evaluation, they have to write annual reports, there are teaching supervision groups, teacher peer review, again in Germany that's not the case at the moment, teacher appraisal, and these aspects too. And evaluation activities, which are, again, they have external agencies for evaluation. So 2003 to 7, um, the Education Revitalization Action Plan established agencies wished to have data banks and metrics created, so a lot of activity happening at this time. And here we see the, the centralized area, so for example the Higher Education Evaluation Center, that's run by the Ministry of Education, so it's a, again a mixture between the government creating something and wishing to that universities follow, and they provide the, the training for
There's a lot more strategy going on now at QA than there was in the past. An area that still needs improvement, data sets. I can speak about Germany, not other countries, but in Germany there are huge data sets that are not being used sufficiently. That's a resource issue because it's not the, there isn't the sufficient man or woman power to actually really interpret the data. So if you're thinking about setting up something, you need to think about how much data you're using and what it actually can do. So don't, we talk about data cemeteries in Germany. It's not a very nice, data graveyards, not very nice, but that's what effectively happens when you create data all the time and it just ends in the graveyard and nobody uses it. Institutional departmental review useful, but what about impact? Impact is something that in Britain is being talked about all the time, and the rankings don't really do justice to impact in higher education. It's not just about five publications that may have made it into the world where the web of science, citation indices, and da da da. Impact in higher education can be made in quite different areas that are not appearing on anyone's agenda. So does that make it better or worse quality? Are we actually looking at impact sufficiently well? So that's it. Thank you very much. We have approximately about 15 minutes uh, for questions and comments. In, in those three models, you, you, I, I really liked your, you know, one of your points that you made that rankings and quality assurance seldom actually look at the quality of teaching and learning and, and you know, not necessarily in a quantitative way, but in a meaningful way. In those three examples, where do you see, which one is actually making the best effort in your opinion, in terms of assessing and promoting the quality of teaching? It's a difficult question to answer. Um, controversially, probably China. Because I think they really, they, they, they took te the quality of teaching at governmental level to be so, to, they really focused on that and put a lot of effort into introducing and encouraging the quality of teaching. So in terms of it being an, uh, an issue that really was focused from the top in China, I think made a big impact in terms of how the colleagues within the Chinese system were going about their, the quality of their teaching. Because if you're thinking about the fact that you know, this is being examined from various angles, I showed very briefly that one slide where you could see all the different things that were going on to try and improve the system. But that's teaching excellent framework in Britain, I think is that I can't really say too much about it because it's so new um, and it's still being developed, they're still trialling and they're still fine-tuning the actual framework itself and linking it then with the student outcomes. Again, that's a very controversial thing, I think, in terms of how can you actually measure how well, for example, somebody has gained in a competence for example, now we're in, in Germany we are, uh, in terms of the definition of modules for example, we're very concerned about defining the competences that we wish our students to have at the end of the module. But how again do you gauge and measure that? So again there are, there are lots of discussions going on and yet it is still very difficult to actually <coughs> transfer that into a functioning system that really is transparent, and logical, I, I talked about the, the rabbit at the beginning being a moving target. You might have done a really good job in your teaching for six years, and in year seven, and you've changed nothing in your teaching, and in year seven, everything goes to pot, and you can't understand what it is that has changed. And it might just be the cohort relationships not, not working in the same way, and that's having a negative impact on the quality of what they're learning. Something that you might not even be realising because it's happening behind the scenes, not in front of you. So there are lots of issues about the quality of teaching that we're not necessarily bringing up on the agenda here. Is still on teaching excellence. I would think that you might have 
very diff different ideals of good teaching, as opposed to science, because their excellence, I think that's, you have more and more less excellence. But in teaching, I wonder what you do with different concepts of what constitutes good teaching. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. I think that's, that's a very important one. If you think about the people that you've met in the course of your whole teaching, uh, in the whole of your learning, thinking about junior school, secondary school, and of course university, how many of the people that you had as your teachers really stood out as being the person from whom you really got the most? I think that's the question that we need to ask. How do we manage to create the people who are going to be able to do that. And I don't see maybe enough support of young academics in particular in, their, in the quality of their teaching. A lot of that is left to chance. I mean, if we think about, the, about what happens in, in the training of teachers for school, gymnasium and so forth, a lot of effort goes into that. And then we have the higher education system, and you go through it. You do your bachelor's, you do your master's, you do your DPhil, and somewhere along that line, you may be allowed to do a bit of teaching. And if you then decide to stay in the academic system, you might do your habilitation and do a little bit, maybe a bit more teaching. Does that make you a really good teacher in your subject? How much support are we giving young and early career academics in the quality of higher education teaching? I don't see enough of that happening. And I certainly in Germany at the moment, there is a lot of that is serendipity in the terms of whether you have a doctoral supervisor who really stresses, you know, I don't, I, I don't want you just to be a, a, an amazing biologist or an amazing chemist, but I really also want you to be a really good teacher of this subject. And I think the Americans, if I'm looking at America, for example, you will get Nobel Prize winners in Princeton and Harvard, wherever they are, I don't know where it would come up. I mean, in, I know for a fact that they get really eminent professors teaching first year students. Why? Because they are the ones, maybe, who, who really have those qualities to try and, you know, inspire and, and make people want to learn. Because it's also about wanting to learn, discipline, yes, but also about being motivated and also about, you know, that. that you know, that the thing that happens that makes you really want to work hard to become as eminent, maybe, as the person who's standing in front of you, who is the inspiration. And I think it's, it's not the right way to have inexperienced people doing, for example, the first and second year training. I think that's a problem. I would prefer to have really good people who have lots of experience do the very, very earliest. That's just my own opinion, but I have got a pedagogic background, so Perhaps I can say that. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I'm just so intrigued by the differences here, especially between Germany and the UK. And then you keep saying that German professors will do this. But still, in the UK, everything's possible. And, and it, you know, it's an audit society, whereas Germany is more. You know, universities are kingdoms of professors so well, what's the reason and where are, we, where are we heading really you know if they are so different still well systems? maybe i was a bit provocative at that point because I, I was talking about the professors in germany of old because certainly in terms of the system accredited universities um, i mean i've had those discussions with, within my former university uh, the, the change it's about ownership and I think if, 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 for example, the professoria is involved in the creation of a system of quality assurance, then the likelihood of that quality assurance system becoming well recognized and accepted is that much higher. And that's why I see huge potential in the system accreditation process, because it's a lot of discussion within the institution. And you get people from different areas, from different faculties, uh, uh, from different faculties coming together to talk for the first time maybe about what they understand quality to be on the, in the first hand and secondly about how they wish to measure quality on the other, that's the next step. But I've, I've seen those discussions and I think that's why uh, as things are happening in Germany I see that as a very positive development 
with the, uh, you know, the ability to choose and select your own system. So maybe I was being a little bit, I was being a little bit provocative about you know, all the German professors in the country, you know, in their ivory tasks. You no, know, that, that was that was the past case, certainly. But today they are in a far more communicative engagement with, with one another around quality. So two more questions I see here. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, giving me this chance to explain my point of view. I'm a VP from China and I'm a PhD student from Alta. And uh, I'm so, so excited that you mentioned China. <laughs> I'm the only person here from China. Um, but I think you know better than me. Uh, anyway, I, I want to, I also wonder in the purpose of quality, uh, quality teaching. Uh, I was a, a university teacher before I came to Hungary. And um, you know why we emphasize the importance of quality teaching because there are so many students and uh, uh, 30, 40 students in one class is, is the normal size. So, so we want to guarantee the graduation rate which is the key factor of evaluating the quality of the university. So, so that's why we always uh, push the teachers and motivate them to, to do better, to perform better. And even the key point, I think, we, why we push them to do so, because we want our students to have a better life. This is the key core uh, purpose of our teaching. Also, we talked about the quality teaching from the teacher's perspective. I also want to mention the, the, the perspective from the individual. We, why we educate people? Because we want them to make a better living, feel better ab about themselves, and feel better about the society. I, I, I did uh, an interview with uh, three, uh, three friends of mine, and the three of them are from the middle class of China, from China, and one of them is a merchant who is not well educated, just a primary school level. And uh, he, he, he's not worried about money, but he feels his life is stressful. And the important thing is that he wants his children to be well educated. And the second one is an engineer who has a, a bachelor degree and also earns quite a lot of money, but he's stressful every day. He's worrying about, okay, what is my future and what can, uh, gonna happen tomorrow? <coughs> This is the second one. And the third one is a professor in the university who has a PhD degree, and he feels very satisfied with his life. And uh, I think uh, even though we compare the quality of teaching, but why? This is important for the whole education system. We are not, we are not going to satisfy the teachers. We are not going to satisfy for the government. We are going to satisfy for all of the people who who who, who undergo the, the, the education process. So this this uh, this is what I, I I'm thinking about. Yeah, this is not a question. If you have a question, <laughs> please make comment. No, thank you very much. I think that, that in a way, what you're, what you're saying is also the link between um, higher education. What is it for? You know, in other words, it is. It's not just about training somebody to go into the market to do a job. It's about much more than that. It's about the person, it's about your position, it's about your, your goals, your, your, your development. And it never stops as far as I'm concerned. You know, it carries on throughout your life. You never stop learning. And we don't take enough time, I think, to think about those aspects, about what it is that, you know, higher education, that's why I, I put it up at the beginning, you know, higher education, and those were not my words, those were Watson's words, um, you know, what higher education is for. And it's about far more than just gaining subject expertise. In fact, I would even be so bold as to say it's, it's the subject expertise is nice and you get it, but actually it's about a lot more than that. It's about leadership, it's about, you know, we talked about that earlier on, but I mean, it, 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 those are the things that, that society needs, and higher education is providing people who are going to be leaders of the and the, the ones who are generating new industry, who are generating new ideas, who are thinking about the problems of society and are trying to solve them. In all of the areas of work that they are in, 
So that, that, that's probably more important, maybe, than obviously the subject area is important, but it's the rest that we're working on. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. I'd like to uh, make one remark, uh, and, and uh, my uh, explanation is coming from uh, the educational science discourse. And uh, one of the things that they do that they get out uh, from the discourse, the word teaching, and they are starting to talk about learning. And that totally redefines the expectations to, uh, to what teaching means because it's rather a facilitator role of the learning environment and in that uh, paradigm you don't need to have uh, highly academically respected uh, uh, persons they are very important in big lecture halls uh, not enough but it's, it's, it's a necessity a, a general expectation traditionally but the professionals who can organize learning are, have a totally different uh, uh, competence map uh, and uh, the students recognize the importance of learning and not the greatness of the facilitator. Uh, and, and if you speak about digitization, the quality of learning is totally independent from teachers. It's about the quality of the digital environment for learning. And it can be quality learning if the digital uh, arena is, is good. So I think the entire quality talk can be fragmented according to the level how we leave behind the tra traditional lecture halls and seminar rooms. For the digital debate, that's, that's another, uh, another big issue. Um, we're talking about, obviously, the digital or digitalization in higher education in Germany a lot at the moment, and uh, how, for example, your present teaching methods can incorporate more digital modes of teaching. But absolutely, you're absolutely right in terms of uh, the idea behind it. It's about how you're learning. And we can learn, of course, independently of a lecture theatre. And I know of quite a few students, for example, in Würzburg, who don't go to lectures. They just download, you know, the, the professor or the lecturer uploads the information and they don't actually go to the lecture. They download maybe at 10 o'clock at night when they feel that that's the right time for them to actually take on board what was said in the lecture. However, that said, higher education, I think, still will always, and this is being perhaps a little bit futuristic, in spite, and in spite of digitalization, I, I do think that there will always be a place simply for people to come together physically, to talk about what it is that they're doing. And I've done telephone conferences, I've done Skype calls with colleagues, and it's not the same thing. You actually need that physical presence of somebody opposite to actually transmit your, you know, how you really feel about something. So, in spite of all of the possibilities that we have, in short, digitalization can help us, no end in our teaching, but I still think that there will always be that need, at least the human need, to be in, physical, in a physical place. <laughs>